Okay, good evening everyone. Um, it's about full hour. Uh, we'll give a minute or so to the last people who are joining us tonight, but uh, if you could, as we did last time, if you could as well uh, this time post your name on the chat so I can get the attendance through that, I would appreciate it. Perfect, thank you all. So I've seen some really good work coming through. So thank you very much for everyone who's already submitted stuff. Um, you're well on your path. And today we were gonna speak about the lab component for for uh, this week. And this week we start with our first lab, which is all about the lab safety. So once I jump to the um, actual presentation, I do end up losing the chat. So if you do have a question and uh, you want to ask it, you can just unmute yourself and shout out. Or if you're too shy to shout out, you can write to the chat and someone from someone else can then just shout out that there's a question on the chat and I'll be happy to jump here to this screen to check it out. Um, again, I'm trying to be respectful of your time. So what we'll do, uh, we'll try to make an early start every time and probably I don't anticipate that this is going to take the full session, but uh, depending on the questions and depending on uh, what we end up covering, if there's any other other topics, uh, it might take, a, take close to the full session, but I'm not expecting it to be uh, quite an hour and 15 minutes. So, um, I have listed again what I wanted us to look at today. So we'll talk a little bit about the lab work. Uh, how does that relate in terms of the work that's conducted in the labs in a whole scale within the kind of big framework? What sort of legal things there are that regulate what we do? But we're going to focus on CAC's aspect, uh, safety, what's important, and then we'll go through some important safety practices. Uh, you had a video that you could watch, and a lot of those are from there. We also will go through the quiz that's part of this week's assignments for the uh, lab component. So what I try to do is uh, every week when you attend to these face-to-face -face sessions, if you attend to these sessions, you should have all the answers to all the homework that uh, you'll be presented. So that's the idea and the concept behind these uh, live sessions that we have. If you don't have any questions, I'm just going to move on right ahead. But if something comes up, like I said, do not hesitate. You don't have to wait to the end. You can just unmute yourself and shout out. So I did go and do a little bit of digging from the uh, U.S. Department of Labor from the Occupational Safety and Health Administration side of the uh, department. And there's about 500,000 plus lab employees in the United States. So that is a significant number. And there's many things that can become issues, uh, potential exposures. These can be chemical, biological, physical, electrical, radioactive, and probably the biggest group of risk factors falls under the musculoskeletal stress that the lab employees end up facing in their work. So that means that uh, various either working in an awkward position or lifting, moving stuff, things like that. But really with all those poss possible exposures and risks that go with that, the key is that we try to prevent them, and that's by paying attention to that and being constantly observing 
potential risks, potential exposures, and then adjusting the way we work in relation to that. And uh, what I have there as a picture is actually an um, old picture from the lab of Pierre Curie. And um, some of you might have heard a name Marie Curie. Uh, she's the first Nobel Prize winner who was a female and did her career's work with the uh, radioactivity. And what I do on this course, we, do, we will every once in a while highlight people that I think often don't get the recognition. Uh, I often say that language of especially my field, medical field, is the language of dead old white men. So uh, a lot of conditions are named after people who discovered or first reported a condition and a lot of terminology uh, comes from that. And really the females are not often given credit for the work that has been done. So that's one of the reasons why I do want to highlight those things as part of this introductory course. Uh, does I'm going to jump out of this screen so I can see the chat. But before I ask, does anyone know uh, more about Marie Curie? Uh, what, what sort of a life did she have? Uh, I believe in storytelling, so uh, I'm always happy to uh, kind of wander off. They all come together and relate to the topics that we're talking. If someone's very familiar with Marie Curie, just give us a shout out. I won't put you on the spot. <laughs> Well, like I said, she did most of her work uh, with uh, discovering the radioactivity and uh, working working on that theme. And um, some of you might have seen a movie that came out some time ago, and um, it talked about radium girls. So radium girls were these females, uh, especially female factory workers, after the radioactivity had been uh, discovered, who worked on painting these watch dials uh, that were able to be illuminated even in the dark. So these kind of glue, uh, even in the dark, the, uh, what, whatever was painted on the watch dial. So um, Radium Girl's name comes from that. And uh, I'm going to warn, sometimes I put pictures. Don't, if you're very squeamish, you might look away. Uh, this is later on one of the Radium Girls. And what you can see here is a tumor growing at the uh, lower jaw. Does anyone have any clue why would these radium girls have ended up with radiation poisoning? Well, the poisoning could show in many different ways as tumors or then parts of the uh, especially lower jaw uh, decaying or having to be eliminated, having to be removed. And that really came from what we can see on this picture from the movie that was uh, that came out some time ago. Uh, a lot of the time, as their standard practice, these girls were advised that if you want to do accurate, fine painting, just dip the paintbrush to your mouth. And of course, they were painting with uh, radioactive substances, so they were getting a high exposure. So this really, the reason why I'm sharing this story with you is that it really illustrates how a lot of the time, as far as I know, throughout my entire working life in various labs where I spent time, uh, I've done a lot of work with organic chemistry, never has it happened that we've had a warning label and then someone has came back and said that, oh, actually, we were too worried about it. It's not actually poisonous. It's pretty much the opposite as far as I can think of all the examples that I've seen. So if we say that something is a potential toxin or dangerous to you, it's probably safe bet to go with that. Uh, rarely do we come back and say that, no, I was just kidding. It actually isn't. 
So uh, that's why we take these exposures uh, seriously. So that was a little bit of a side story, but highlighting the importance of of um, paying good lab practices and also uh, being respectful for those warnings and to the, uh, applying the knowledge that we get. So there are some legal aspects that regulate our work as well uh, in our college labs. So there's various different regulations, both on local, state, and federal level. And the Occupational Safety and Health Administration is really one of these that sets various different rules, standards, and guidance. And these are not just in terms of making the lab safe for the general public. It's a lot to do with the workers' right and employees employers responsibilities to take the work keep the workers safe so even though you're not working at the college we are still responsible of making sure that we keep you safe so that's why it's so important that we go through some of the basic lab safety aspects because it is our role and it is our duty to make sure that you are taken care of while you're working in the labs of ours. And you might ask from me now that, well, why on earth would I care about this since I'm on a online course? And we're going to talk about that in a second. But first of all, I want to say that this lab safety, it's all about the safety of you, but it's also just as much about the safety of everyone else around you, everyone else who's in that lab, in that building, or in case even in your home, in your immediate surroundings. Uh, one good example is that we still do not know for sure uh, the COVID, where it came from, but if it came from a lab, there would be a, clearly an issue with the lab safety. So we want to make sure that uh, we are not only putting ourselves at risk if we don't follow the lab safety practices, we put others at risk. And uh, since we are at the school, at an educational institution, it's important that you learn the correct lab safety practices. And one of the things that's actually listed as an intended learning outcome for this course is that by the end of this course, you know how to operate safely in a lab. So even though you're now in an online course, it doesn't mean that you might not be taking some of your other courses in a face-to-face -face or hybrid format. For example, the microbiology classes, the Bio 205, they're commonly requiring that uh, I, I see rarely uh, micro classes that wouldn't have some sort of a hands-on component. It's just a course that really requires that. And if you're planning to transfer to university or nursing medicine, any other field, you are bound to end up working in labs. So this is the course where we're setting the basic standards of how to be safe in a lab. So uh, that's, that's the reason why we're covering those here. And of course, there's a lot of other transferable skills. It's not just that we study whatever we study in the, uh, this institution, because I think that it's really important that you know every single bone in the body. It's actually the process of learning and showing evidence that you're capable of doing that, that we're, we're trying to learn and we're trying to teach. So that's why, why we're doing this week's lab and what it's all about. And if you watch that movie or that little video that I included in the study materials, a lot of these lab safety practices should be familiar to you. And every now and then I'll jump out of that. Please feel free to join in, uh, unmute yourself, answer in a chat. It kind of makes it a little bit smoother for everyone if you if you shout out if you have ideas, especially for the questions that I ask. But one of the most important basic uh, rules of thumb when you work in a lab, and especially on, on our courses, is that before you start, read all of the instructions, not just the first step, but make sure that you've read the entire process. 
because just like if you've ever done any baking, you know that sometimes in recipes, they forget to list one of the ingredients or there's something important later on that you find out once you're working through the recipe. So we don't want to end up in a situation where you've done a lot of steps and then you find out that there's something fundamentally that we're missing we don't have or that wasn't mentioned at the beginning. You want to make sure that you understand the entire process. So before we make a start, make sure that you read all of those instructions. Uh, the personal protective equipment, PPE, it's so important. So we want to protect you, but we also want to protect your clothing. So that's the reason why you will be wearing a lab coat if you're working in a lab. Um, we also want to, like I said, protect you, your skin. You're going to be wearing gloves. You're going to be wearing goggles, depending a little bit on what you're doing. But we want to make sure that you're, you're appropriately protected. And PPE doesn't apply only to labs. There's many other, other settings where you have to wear relevant personal protective uh, equipment depending on what task you're doing and so on and i think that the best example that we're seeing is that we're wearing a lot of us masks the other thing if you are coming to the labs at cac or anywhere else really that i can guarantee you that will get you turned away from the door of the lab if you don't follow it. You need to have appropriate shoes. And appropriate lab shoes means that you have closed toes shoes. They have a hard sole. So they're really not things like flip flops or they're not whatever fashion statement you want to do. High heels, unless you really need them, I probably wouldn't recommend. And I also wouldn't put the best, fanciest shoes that you have. I know that since we are in Arizona, Clearly, I wasn't born here, so I'm still learning to survive with the heat. But I know that it gets warm here in the summer. And I know that maybe the flip-flops might be a good idea because of that. But I tell my students in my face-to-face -face classes that if nothing else, if you're taking a course where you know that you have to come to lab at our college, if nothing else, I would encourage you to carry in your car a set of shoes that's compatible with what we're expecting for labs. So carry a set of tennis shoes or something else, just in case if you come to the class and then you realize that, darn it, I'm wearing now flip-flops, I can't attend if I don't change my shoes, you have something what to change to. So uh, we don't store extra uh shoes at the at our college labs for you to use uh, and you really will be turned away at the door if the shoes are not appropriate so you want to cover the toes and you want that the shoes are hard um that's probably the most common issue that i end up seeing with my students has anyone ever wondered what happens this is kind of taking an off tangent to what we're talking what happens to the flip flops when you have finished using them are they something that uh, decays really well well i'll show you uh, one thing that happens to the flip-flops is that they end up as landfill and they don't actually really uh, decay very easily so that is a problem in certain areas uh, and since they're made of plastic we end up finding those on certain ocean currents and uh, trash islands that are being formed so just kind of a interesting side tangent. I do teach some environmental sciences and uh, I have very good colleagues who also teach environmental sciences. If you're interested of those great trash streams on the oceans and so on, that might be a course that you want to look into. For anyone who has long hair, uh, I would encourage you to tie the hair back when you're working in a lab, uh, especially when you're doing something where it might come to your way. And second rule that most of my students end up having to uh, 
find through a hard way is that there's absolutely no eating and no drinking in a lab setting. Even if you're not conducting a lab experiment, even if we were ha having a regular lecture class, but it would be in a lab setting, in a lab room, you would not be allowed to eat or drink in a lab. And this is simply because of how our labs are regulated. So we might lose a right to have a lab uh, as, a, as a college if we end up uh, having been audited and there's violations on these. The other thing that I'm kind of surprised that I do have to mention is that there is no smoking in labs. And I think the reason why I'm having to mention that is more to do with these e-cigarettes that are becoming more common nowadays. So even though there's not actual flame on these e-cigarettes, we still do not smoke in the lab settings. We wouldn't smoke even in a regular classroom or hallway or anywhere like that. Uh, for anyone, and I don't want to be gender specific, anyone who wears makeup, uh, one good hint is that do not wear a mascara when you know that you're going to be doing microscopy. That's going to cause you a lot of trouble if your eyelashes then end up uh, coloring the lens that you're looking through. So those are probably the most important rules, but there's a couple of others that I do want to mention and the video addressed as well. So if you're dealing with any hot objects, you should never touch those with bare hands. So we have heat resistant gloves, thongs, and many other tools that are meant for dealing with these hot objects. So don't go by uh, bare hands and don't go excited just that, oh, I'm gonna go and grab this quickly. Uh, the, we're learning the proper procedures and even if you might get away with it at home, lifting something from the oven that's only mildly warm uh, by bare hands, we don't do that in the lab setting. A um, couple of kind of basic things, just as in an airplane you would identify exits, we do that in a lab setting as well, so you know how to leave the space if there was an issue. There also are certain pieces of equipment, tools that you want to know. You want to know where the eye wash station is. So if you have something that spills to your eyes, uh, these eye wash stations allow you immediately get to rinsing your eyes. Same for shower. So it's not having a regular shower. It's an emergency use only. But if you have something that spills on you, for example, uh, Every lab should be set up with these at our college. And um, really, it's worth of knowing where they are. We regularly check people of, like me who work at the labs at the college. We're responsible of making sure that they also work. Uh, you might want to know also where the emergency shut off for gas, other other things such as electricity is if depending on what kind of a lab it is and where the fire extinguisher is so those are the basic tools that we want to know where they are uh, basically as a rule of thumb the recommendation is that you treat all chemicals that you'll be using as if they were hazardous. So read the labels and read them a couple of times the labels to make sure that you have the right chemical. Nothing's as uh, easy as working with multiple chemicals and picking up the wrong chemical. So you wanna make sure that you're using the right stuff. Um, if you end up weighing a lot of stuff, especially if we're doing uh, actually quantifying the uh, results, you're doing numeric results, not just whether a reaction happened or not. Uh, you want to make sure that you weigh material. Uh, usually we weigh the material on a balance pan, but you don't put the material directly to there. You use a transfer beaker or some sort of a weighing paper or whatever is appropriate for that specific uh, material that you're using. If you end up finding that you get cut in a lab, for example, there's a sharp piece of glass, you do want to rinse and then perform the appropriate first aid 
for that cut site. The other thing is that if there's broken glass where you do want to inform the instructor immediately and the instructor takes the legal responsibility of the lab. So you want to make them aware and then we do end up disposing any glass immediately uh, using the brush and a pen you should never pick the pieces of glass by hand even if you were wearing gloves and there's a specific glass bin where we dispose all of the uh, glass so let's let's be sure to use those and we don't put other stuff to the glass bins if there is a chemical spill, again, inform the instru instructor. And depending on what kind of a chemical we're using, what sort of quantities we're dealing with, we might use a spill kit or just regular paper towers to clean it. If that chemical were to fly on your clothes or be on your clothes, uh, we want to remove that layer of clothing so it doesn't stay on, on you. If there's chemicals on the skin, we, of course, then move on to rinsing that side. Eyes, uh, especially, we talked about those eye wash stations. It's about 15 to 20 minutes that we will wash those eyes immediately. And on these things, really, the time is of an essence. Quicker we get to rinse uh, impacted area, the greater results we have. So uh, I don't know if I too much mentioned about it, but I do have background in medicine. So really there's only one field that makes me squeamish and it's both chemical and fire burns. I'm totally comfortable working with cavaters, dead people and so on, but burns always make me a little squeamish. So uh, I, I say that as a showing you that that is a serious thing to be aware of. Uh, one thing that, again, that I find a little interesting that I have to warn is that we should never be smelling or tasting chemicals. Uh, we use good labeling, and that should be what we rely on. We don't go sniffing chemicals directly. And if you are dealing with chemicals, the proper transfer uh, procedures become important. So we don't carry them just as we would be carrying any other thing. You might be using an extra container, uh, we definitely using both hands and uh, making sure that the road where you're going is cl uh, clear. You don't have to land it somewhere, put it on the side uh, halfway through the road. So all of those things uh, become much more accurate and concrete to you when we are actually in a physical lab setting. Um, the other thing that I often see with students, the contamination of chemicals, we want to make sure that we don't put the chemical that we've been using back to the stock bottle. There is a risk that that chemical has gotten contaminated while we've been working with it, and then the entire stock would get contaminated. So there's a proper disposal way for various different chemicals, and that varies depending on the chemical. So your instructor will be briefing you on that depending on what you'll be using. And also another good advice uh, from experience, if you are going to be pouring, taking some new chemical, make sure you know how much you need it rather than starting to eyeball it and making it up as you go along. So have a plan before you get into action. Uh, we do use in our labs distilled water rather than tap water. Distilled water is needed for the purity of reactions and we generally don't use it for washing. There are some specific occasions where we might need to do that, especially when we're preparing microscopic samples. There we might end up using distilled water on washing certain equipment and certain tools. I mentioned about the fire, that that's one thing that makes me squeam is the burns, uh, whether it's chemical or a fire. If there is a fire, no matter on the size in the lab, you notify the instructor. And if your clothing or the clothing of lab partner of yours is uh, on fire, follow the stop, drop and roll procedure. 
uh, you should not be touching your face. And I think we've all learned that now during this pandemic. So we've all pe become pretty good about that. And before you leave the lab, you want to make sure that your lab station is nice and clean. You wipe it down and you wash your hands. Actually, all of my students who I work with uh, in an actual face-to-face -face format these days, we do that whether we're in a lab or not. We make sure that when we come, we clean the workspace. Uh, and when we leave, we clean the workspace. That's just uh, the times that we live in. Does anyone recognize who that girl is on that picture? That's the girl that was on the video and she didn't do too great of a job with the lab safety practices. So you can see she's got bandages, her shirt is burned. I think her lab partner even in the end said that this isn't working out. So you don't want to be that who your lab partner tells you that, hey, you're not the greatest lab partner. Let's part ways. So those are the general lab safety practices. Do you have any questions about those? I think you should be pretty good. If you have questions, do not hesitate to ask me later on. Uh, I promise that we will go through all of the questions in your quiz. So if you haven't completed the quiz, you can open the quiz on another tab. And this is normally how I try to do these sessions. Uh, where we're talking about the material from the course. If you attend to these, more or less, we will go through all the questions and what answers you should know for those questions. And of course, I do record these sessions. You might see that the first one was already uploaded there. And you can also find it from the Collaborate underneath there, the recording. But um, if you are yet to do the quiz, this is a good time to open it up and let's work through this. And on this one, I am going to need your help. You can just shout out. You don't need to raise your hand or you can type it to the chat. Uh, but I don't want to be guessing the correct answers myself. So it helps if you take part. So let's have a look of the questions that we have. The first question is that if you notice an unsafe or hazardous condition or apparatus, what should you do? Should you notify the instructor in a lab? Do we think that that's true? You should notify the instructor or do we think it's false? We are not going to tell. That's great. Thank you. It is true. Good job. So we do want to notify the instructor if something's not working, if something's unsafe. So again, if you're taking the quiz, this is a good time uh, to find the answers to those questions. Sometimes in some of the quizzes, I do end up jumbling up the order of questions, but there are 16 questions in the quiz, so they will be there. Uh, so good job, everyone who got that correct. The second question that I have is that, are you allowed to bring and eat your foods or drinks in the lab as long as there's no lab class. And we talked about this just a moment ago. <laughs> that is true. It is not allowed. Good job. So you're correct. We are not to eat or drink in a lab, even if the lab class would not be taking place, because what you'll end up finding is that on these labs and on those benches, we do all sorts of things. We do dissections of animals. My students normally work with uh, smaller pigs, for example, and you really don't want to be eating uh, cavaderic preservation liquids. Uh, we do some experiments where we use bacteria uh, such as E. coli. Well, what E. coli does, it gives you the poops. So you definitely don't want to by accident end up that in your drink or food. So I really would keep those drink bottles, food packages away, even if, if you were just temporarily storing them. So thank you for everyone who's been taking part. The next question that I have is that you can start the lab before you are instructed to do so. Should we just jump into the lab right away? <laughs> That's good job there, everyone who answered. You are absolutely correct. We do not do that. So that statement is false. We do not want to start lab before you are instructed to do so. Uh, just an interesting side 
No, that picture actually is from an FBI classroom. Uh, so I have had a pleasure of working with many people who have interesting careers. So um, as the course moves along, I'll be happy to share about those uh, a little more. The next question is that the common routes of exposure to chemicals, what are the common routes that the chemicals get into our body? Is it through inhalation, ingestion, skin contact, eye contact, all of the above? You are correct. Excellent job there. So you are absolutely correct. It's all of those routes. Those are some of the most common routes for uh, chemicals to get into the body. Uh, one interesting side fact, if we were to consider which ones of those are easiest for chemicals to get into your body, actually through your eye is one of the easiest ways for chemicals to get into your body. There's very little protective layers there because we do need to see. So that's why it becomes important that we wear goggles. So um, that when we're working with chemicals. So something to keep on mind. Uh, the next, you were correct about that. It was all of the above. So E, the next question asks that you just heated a beaker on the hot plate and now you want to pick it up. Should you use a washcloth or paper tower to hold the beaker? Use your bare hands. The glass will not be hot. Cool the beaker with cold water before handling it or use the heat resistant gloves and or wait until the beaker cools down. And I see excellent job there. So it's the answer D, you're absolutely correct about that. We use heat resistant gloves or other tools or then we simply wait until the beaker cools down. Uh, I really appreciate it. I can tell you as a side note that I do keep a record during our classes if someone who participates, if you're actively participating and your grade ends up being in between two grades, it automatically gets pumped to a higher grade. So it's always a good idea to take part. Um, I, I do keep a record of those. The next question that I have is that before you start an experiment, what should you do? Should you read all of the instructions or directions? Should you clear the lab bench of all of the books, pocket books, book bags, and other non-essential material? Should you ask your instructor if you have any questions? Uh, will you wait until your instructor explains the procedure and advises the class of any hazards? Or should you do all of the above? And I see correct answers coming through from there. That's true. We do all of those. So all of those were correct things to do before the experiment starts. So again, well done for anyone who picked that up. Uh, the picture is not actually a cup of tea. It is a chemistry experiment. I promise it's, it's not just someone cooking a drink. I realize now on hindsight that there probably wasn't the best picture I could have picked. The next question that I have is that which of the following is considered to be proper attire for the laboratory? Close to shoes, clothing that sufficiently covers bare skin to minimize any exposure to splashed or spilled chemicals, long hair pulled back or pinned up or all of the above. And perfect job, I see again, there's a good number of answers and the answer is of course all of the above so again thank you for everyone who's taking part i like i said i do appreciate it and i do take notes so that that will be noted that you're actively participating the next question that i have uh, is actually why must chemicals never be removed from the lab? Is it because you don't have proper containers to hold them? Is it because they are expensive and there is not enough chemicals for everyone to take them home? The chemicals can pose a health and contamination hazard to anyone who comes into contact with them. Or could it be because you do not have the proper apparatus to do experiments at home? And I see correct answers coming through again. I I'm pleased to see that you know that it is because the chemicals can be a health 
and contamination risk to anyone who comes into contact with them, not just you, but other people as well. And again, as a side note, that picture is actually from the US Coastal Guard Academy there. They have also chemistry training there. Uh, I find it always funny that they're wearing their full uniform on those classes, but that's, that's the way they do things there. The next question that I have is that how should you dispose broken glass? Are you going to leave it to the bench top, drop the glass shards into the nearest trash container, sweep up the glass with a brush and dustpan and then place it in a glass disposal box or place the broken glass in the fume hood? And perfect job everyone who answered. I saw everyone got that correct. So it is all about making sure that we sweep up the glass with a brush and dustpan and then place it in a glass disposal box. So we get to the question number 10 now. What should you do if you get a chemical in one or both of your eyes? Are you going to go to the eye wash immediately, wash your eyes out with water at the eye wash station and call the instructor, determine the identity of the chemical, consult the doctor to assess the injury, or should you do all of the above? And you are correct, we're going to do all of the above. And we do it for the sake of safety. Even if you think you're going to be fine, we're still going to run this by the doctor. Uh, but really what becomes most important is the quick action quickly getting the chemical washed away from the eye. So uh, that's where we start and then we deal with the rest. So perfect job. It was all of the above for that question. Uh, is eating and drinking in the lab? So eating and drinking in the lab is not permitted because you may have a bad breath, which your lab partner surely would not appreciate. Or is it because chemical could contaminate your food and drinks and you do not want to mistake a beverage for a laboratory chemical instead? Uh, you would have to share with the entire class or is it none of the above? And I see you're answering correctly. It is that the chemical could contaminate your foods and drinks and you do not want to mistake anything that's your personal consumption to a, actually a laboratory chemical. Horrible mistakes, horrible accidents have happened this way. And like we spoke earlier on, we have all sorts of stuff out at the labs, especially on microbio class, if you end up taking that. We work with some uh, pretty wild stuff. There, none of them are highest danger category, but you can definitely get yourself sick if you end up consuming those certain microbes that we work with. So good job. The answer for that was B as you identified. I don't know why I ended up picking a picture of a picnic uh, cloth there, but I guess it was about eating and drinking. So the next question that I have is that which activity would be considered an unsafe use of a Bunsen burner? Should you be heating flammable chemical in a beaker if it's, it has a risk of being flammable? Hmm, that sounds bad. Heating a liquid in a test tube and point it towards your lab partner or towards yourself. That sounds a little hostile. Heating a piece of glassware that has a crack in it. Oh, I don't know about that. Anyone who's had their windshield cracked in Arizona knows what happens when it heats up to that crack. Or leaving the experiment unattended. Well, if we are working with open flame, we don't leave it unattended. So the correct answer is going to be all of the above options. And again, really well done for all of those who answered. So we don't do any of those. Those all would be unsafe use of the burner. If we have a large fire in a lab, does that require that the students evacuate the area and call for assistance? Would it be best extinguished by throwing sand on it? Or would it be best extinguished by throwing water on it? Or none of the options? I see answers coming through. Good job. So if it is a large fire, we do need to evacuate the area and call for assistance. We're not going to try to be heroes. If something is beyond our skill set, 
beyond our scale, we then ask for help. So your safety comes first. Uh, if we have to evacuate, we normally leave all the stuff behind. So we want you to be safe. Stuff can be replaced, but you cannot. Uh, the next question that I have is, in case of, the, of a large chemical spill on your clothing, what should you do? Should you go to the safety shower immediately and call your instructor over? Should you remove the affected clothing? Should you rinse the affected area for 15 to 20 minutes to get rid of the chemical from your skin? Or is it all of the options above and you are correct? All of you who answered, I saw everyone got that right. It is all of the options above that apply in terms of if we have a chemical spill on the clothing. So good job. And second last question that I have for you is which of the following is not part of your personal protective equipment? Is it the close to shoes? Is it the goggles? Is it the fume hood or is it the gloves? And perfect job, I see answers coming through. It is the fume hood. That's not part of the PPE. So uh, fume hood, even though you might think of a hoodie and hood of a shirt, fume hood is where we work with chemicals where we need to be especially good ventilation. That's not something you carry with you personally as you're working in a lab. So good job there. Um, the very last question that we have on the quiz and that I have for tonight is that if you spill a liquid chemical, what should you do? Should you move away from the spill and notify your instructor immediately? Should you avoid the spill area and clean it up after the class is over? Or should you clean up the spill and throw the paper towels away in just regular trash? Or should we evacuate the laboratory? And you're correct. I see good job there. So we move away from the spill and notify the instructor immediately. That's the right thing to do. So excellent work there. So those were all of the questions that are going to be in your quiz for the lab. So uh, if you were working along as we completed this, you should have 100% for that lab. I know that few students have to do it few times. I think you can have unlimited number of times to work through it. So the key there is just to be very accurate. I recall that some students were also doing that on their phone and sometimes phones are a little bit temperamental. They don't get, take the correct answers. If you're trying to do Blackboard assignments on the phone, just a friendly tip, there is an app that you can download. It's the Blackboard app. And that actually works much better than just running a web page on your browser window if you're using your handheld device for, uh, for completing activities. So just something to keep in mind. Do remember that we do loan also as a college laptops. Uh, for you, you can keep them for entire semester. Uh, I think it's first come first served basis. So it's definitely word of doing that. The contact person for that is Samuel Rifkin. I can post about that an announcement on our course, just in case if anyone is missing a laptop that you can't work on school assignments because you don't have a laptop. We're happy to step in and help you out with that. Uh, so that's that's one of the things that we do happily provide you for load. And really, that kind of wraps up all that I had planned for tonight. Like I said, it's not going to take quite the entire time. Does anyone have any questions about this week's assignments, about the lab, or about anything else that my knowledge and skills might reach out uh, to or reach to help? I'm, I'm not guaranteeing I have all the answers in life, but uh, anything to do with this course, I'll definitely try to help. If you have any questions, feel free just to shout out or feel free to type into the chat or lift your hand. If you don't have questions, would 
be doing lab projects from home? That's a good question. So all of the labs that we're going to do on this course are going to be labs that you can complete at home. And most of them are going to be virtual labs. There are few labs where you have a choice that you can also do that lab yourself and then also follow as it's done online. But you don't have to do them yourself. We're focusing more on the virtual side of things, analyzing data and so on. But if you've never actually dissolved the egg shell before, seeing what an egg is without the shell around it, uh, that's one fun lab to join along and do it at home as we're working through it. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. But to answer your question, everything will be done from home. You don't have to show up to the campus. Uh, everything is online on this course. But that's why it's important, even though it might feel a little abstract that we're going through so certain things, it's important that you still learn the same skills, same knowledge as anyone else who would be in a classroom. So that was a very long answer to a very simple question. Everything is done from home. Any other questions? I don't see any other questions coming through, but if something, okay, excellent. Well, I'm glad that that helped. If something else comes up, I'm gonna be around here and I'm always reachable through the Blackboard messages and through emails as well. But that's all I had planned for today's session. Next week, we're actually going to move on to the very first chapter of the learning material. And we're going to be talking about the study of the life. And biology as a term refers to the scientific study of the life. So uh, that's what we'll be starting with. What is biology? How do we define it? And what is not biology? So that's next week. Uh, at this point, I'm going to thank you for having joined me for tonight, and I'm going to wish you a very good weekend and very good rest of the evening. Uh, I hope everyone has found the assignments this week as doable. Uh, I will be sending some emails out or messages after if I haven't heard anything from a student. I just don't want anyone to be dropped if you're still wanting to participate. So uh, make sure that you get at least one of the assignments in. That way we can make sure that you remain on the class. And of course, by showing up to these sessions, you're guaranteed to also stay on the class. So that's all I have for tonight. Thank you for joining me. Like I said, I'm going to be around here. I hope you guys have a great night and uh, enjoy the weekend. Thank you. I really appreciate that. <laughs> you folks have a good one as well. <laughs> Perfect. Like I said, I'll be around here for a while, but you really have, there's nothing else that I'm going to uh, cover. So this is it for tonight. <laughs> Do you need to log in tomorrow for attendance? Uh, was the question. No, you're absolutely fine. If you have done the discussion topic, you're all done for today uh, or, for, or for the week. As long as the assignment gets done, then you're covered. So uh, the answer is that no, you do not need to log in tomorrow if you have already submitted the discussion topic. You, you're one step ahead of the curve. So good job. I'm very impressed. <laughs> have a good night. Okay, what I'm going to do, I'm going to stop the recording. And if anyone wants to ask any questions outside the uh, recording, I'm still going to be here. But otherwise, that's it for tonight.